Hello, my name is Steve Lopez. I'm a columnist with the Los Angeles Times. And for more than a year now, I've been writing about death and dying. It all began with my father's demise um, in a number of medical, ethical, legal quandaries that our family faced. And it got me into uh, the business of um, trying to find out what um, our end-of-life options are. And um, recently, I had uh, two more columns on this very subject, a column on a man in Palm Springs in California, um, 87 years old, who was um, led out of his house in handcuffs uh, moments after his wife, his terminally ill wife, had died. He was arrested on suspicion of murder, and uh, his crime was to have honored his wife's wish to um, remove her um, nasal oxygen catheter um, she was suffering, she was ready to die, and he held her hand and said, I love you, and she died, and he was arrested. He was later released after being held for three days on $1 million bail. Um, I then wrote more recently about a woman who had read that column and emailed me to say that her husband in Northern California was dying a barbaric death, and she wished we had more end-of-life options. Um, I got on a plane. I flew up there. As I got there, her husband was being led out on a gurney. Um, uh, Donnie Wester died last week, and uh, his wife, Sandy, said to me, I want to get involved in trying to find a way to have more options. And I'm asked often, um, over the last year I've been asked hundreds of times by people, why doesn't California have um, what Oregon and what, uh, what Washington have? Those states have what is uh, often referred to as death with dignity. And so today to discuss end-of-life options, to give some advice to those of you who are dealing with difficult end-of-life decisions, we have two guests, and I'm happy to have them. One is Catherine Tucker. She is the legal uh, director at Compassion and Choices. This is the nonprofit that has been involved in expanding our awareness of and advocating for uh, end-of-life options. And we have also joining us Dr. Judy Neal Epstein, the clinical director of the end-of-life consultation program for Compassion and Choices. Now we would um, appreciate getting questions from you. You can send them to us and I'll pass them on to our guests. And um, I'd like to start, I think, with Catherine Tucker. Um, Catherine, that question that I always get, I, I frequently get, why doesn't California have more options at the end of life for people who want what your organization refers to now as rather than physician assisted suicide aid in dying why doesn't california have such an option should it have such an option um, and what are the chances that uh, the state ever will right well thanks steve and thanks for hosting this program it's so important to talk about these issues um, you know california should join a growing number of states there are now um, at least four states that have an open practice of aid in dying. Aid in dying refers to when a phys physician writes a prescription for medication to a mentally competent, terminally ill patient that the patient can self-administer to bring about a peaceful death. That practice is open in the states of Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Hawaii. Um, it is less clear in other states that that is a safe thing for physicians to offer their patients um, because, as you mentioned with the case with the man in Palm Springs, um, there is a statute in California that makes a crime of, of quote, assisting a suicide. And so um, it's possible that a aggressive prosecutor could challenge the act of a physician writing such a prescription and initiate a criminal prosecution against that physician under an assisted suicide statute. Now it's important to recognize that the choice of a dying patient for a peaceful death is no kind of suicide. And so this assumption that uh, the Physician's Act might bring the physician within the reach of a criminal punishment is probably not well founded. But physicians are very cautious there is a widespread assumption that the statute might reach their conduct and so they simply don't offer that choice to their patients. The tragedy then is, as happened in the Northern California case you mentioned, is that the patient suffers horrifically 
begs the loved ones to help achieve death. And sometimes those loved ones do assist through something like making a gun available or other means that are not peaceful, they're not humane, uh, or the patient just suffers right up until a pro prolonged death finally arrives. Um, so it is important for California to expand choice to include aid in dying, and we're working to in that direction to make that choice available here, among many other choices, because of course, you know, some patients will choose um, aggressive pain and symptom management. Some patients might choose to forego food and fluid. Other patients might choose sedation to unconsciousness until death arrives. But for some fraction of patients, aid in dying is an important choice. Uh, Catherine, I think uh, I, we should uh, point out that um, this we're talking about a choice. We're not talking about um, you know forcing anybody um, to, to use this option. And uh, I think right. that people do want more options. Um, so this is not to suggest that this is right for everybody. Now, why is it, um, you, you and I have talked about whether this can happen um, at the polls. Um, what are your thoughts on whether this can be accomplished in California at the ballot box? Right, well, California is a state where initiative campaigns take place. And so you can um, imagine a, an initiative campaign around this. And the initiative process is what brought the um, choice for aid in dying in the states of Oregon and Washington. And it, as you probably know, it's also an initiative measure on the ballot this fall in the state of Massachusetts. Initiative campaigns, extremely expensive, especially in California with such large media market, very, very expensive. And what tends to happen uh, in those campaigns is a lot of polarization and a lot of money expended by very vigorous minority opponents of this choice. And that would be typically the Catholic Church is very opposed to patients being empowered with end-of-life choices. And you also see the so-called right to life movement that wants to ensure that dying patients are not free to make their own choices, but rather um, suffer uh, an extended death if, if that's their fate. And so you run into very active, well-funded opponents in initiative campaigns. We did have legislators in California try to move this through the conventional legislative process. And again, it runs into legislators um, being wary of embracing this issue, even though voters want this choice, because of the very vocal, well-funded um, opposition groups. So I think California probably is um, going to see this choice arise through the uh, physician provider community beginning to make this choice available and under best practices, which is how most medicine is practiced. Not subject to a statute, not subject to a court decision, but subject to uh, physician best practices. And that's what we're seeing unfold right now in the state of Hawaii. Um, and I think California could follow in those footsteps. Uh, Catherine, for a Californian who wants to help advance this cause, um, what's your advice? What should they do to get involved? Well, of course, Compassion and Choice is very active in the state. We have a Northern California chapter and a Southern California chapter, um, and, and we are a national nonprofit. So we love to have supporters um, join us, visit our website, become active. Um, be educated, speak out on this issue, write letters to the editor, be in touch with columnists and media who are following the issue to raise the dialogue. And um, we do expect to see progress in California. California has a lot of really great measures already in place to ensure that patients get information about end-of-life choices and have a lot of good choices. So California is in the forefront in many ways in terms of aggressive pain and symptom management and ensuring that patients have information about choices. So I think we are in progress in California and expanding choice to include aid in dying is a next step. Okay, I want to move now to Dr. Epstein who, uh, who runs the end-of-life consultation program. Uh, Dr. Epstein, um, when I wrote these last two columns, I got um, a lot of comments um, across the board. This is very typical. I have people who object to any consideration 
of um, uh, aid in dying, um, those tend to be um, faith-based um, uh, organizations or individuals who think this is something that ought to be in God's hands and humans should get out of the way and let nature follow its course. Um, I also get um, uh, comments from people saying, well, aren't palliative and hospice care um, good alternatives? And yes, of course, in many cases they are, but those don't answer all of the issues. Um, and uh, I, 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 um, I was talking to you earlier today um, about um, the fact that if somebody is in doubt, let's take Sandy Wester, who just a week ago um, was desperate for some consult. Um, she could have called, couldn't she? She could have called um, mm -hmm. your service. And what kind of services are available? What kind of advice is there for somebody who is dealing with uh, an end-of-life crisis? Sure. Well, thank you, Steve. Those are, those are great questions. And to first answer the question you were asking about, you know, why not leave this in God's hands? And, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot amongst ourselves and with our clients is that, you know, the relationship um, that a person has with God as they perceive God is their, is their private relationship and not something that we want to get in the middle of or that we feel government should get in the middle of and that we're really all about choice. You know, it's, this may not be the right thing for some people. There may be people out there who, who don't want the choice, that wish to leave their lives and their dying in God's hands, and that's great for them. But there are other people who do want choice, and those are the people that come to us. Those are the people that we talk to, that we educate. And so I think that's one piece. Um, you know, the thing is, is we hear from people all over the country. Our, we have a national... Um, end-of-life consultation program, and we have clinical coordinators who are trained nurses, social workers, counselors, to talk to people about their options. And we uh, work with anybody and everywhere, not to necessarily um, provide them information, but to help them find what's right for them in terms of advanced planning, future planning, or if they're terminally ill, to find an option that is right for them. And there's no option that's right for everybody. It's not a cookie cutter thing. It's very much an individual process and an individual practice. We, our average time that we work with people is 150 days. So we really build that relationship and we get to know people and their families and we just become a part of their, their exiting this life process. They're leaving this life process and um, their dying process. So. You know, one of the things that we see a lot is poor symptom management, poor pain management when people are terminally ill and or actively dying. And we really help um, pe um, people have the right language and proper um, ways to talk to their hospice care providers to try and help them get enough care and enough support and uh, an aggressive support when they need it. And hospice is wonderful that way. And we work with hospices. Um, we're very supportive of hospice care. And some people do um, suffer so much that the medications just can't touch it. And, and then we talk about palliative sedation. And um, palliative, palliative sedation is a fairly new arm of medicine. It's um, growing in leaps and bounds as we learn more about how that works. And it's not part of all hospices yet, but it would be nice if it was. Um, but that's, a, you know, where someone is put um, under enough medication where they're basically unconscious and no longer aware of their suffering. And they end up dying as a result of not having any food or fluids in their system. And then they um, pass peacefully under the care of a physician and the, uh, under the eyes of a nurse. And is that, that is perfectly legal in, uh, even in California. That is right? part of practice mm -hmm. and there are many trained palliative care specialists um, the, the thing is what that what people lose by making that choice is that they are not present for their death their family um, has uh, their family members see them in bed maybe at home but probably not it's usually done in a hospital or a hosp in hospice care in house hospice care um, but they don't get to have those last days with their person, their, fa their loved one. They don't get to speak with them and talk with them and play music with them and hug them and kiss them and have any interaction as they're dying. And so that's a big loss for some families. You know, one of the beautiful things that we've seen 
in Oregon and Washington and Montana is um, that when people choose the time and place of a peaceful death, they um, are able to then sit with their families and say their goodbyes and have this incredibly beautiful experience that we would love to see everybody get to have. And so, you, you, know, you know, Doctor, I, I hear from people who say, well, if somebody wants to die, why don't they just stop eating or stop uh, drinking any liquids? And of, of course, that is an option. But you can't, uh, when you do that, achieve what, you're just, what you've just talked about. Um, you don't know how long that might take. Um, is that something that you would ever recommend to somebody who, who um, is looking for an option? Is that one that you recommend to just stop eating, stop uh, taking any liquids? Right. Well, uh, well, we never really recommend anything. We truly are educators. We provide information so people can make their own choice. And for some people, that is a, a, a really great choice. Um, it's, it, it can be done in a way that is um, profoundly um, satisfactory for family members and for people. They, people generally slowly, you know, they just slowly kind of fall into a deep sleep and then they pass away. So their family is with them as that process happens. And it's, if it's managed properly with excellent care and around the clock support and hospice support, um, it can be a, a great option for some people. I think we want to point out, uh, this is important, that uh, anybody, even uh, people who are perfectly healthy in advance of any terminal illness or critical situation, should fill out some forms. Um, you should fill out forms, uh, advance health care directives, and appoint, um, appoint uh, those people in your life who you want to speak for you. Catherine, can you talk about that, the importance of doing that? Right. Well, I think you just hit on it, Steve, which is um, a advanced directive, which is a written document that expresses your wishes with regard to interventions to prolong your life and with regard to wishes for pain and symptom management, etc. You can um, find those documents on Compassion and Choices website. You can typically also find the state approved form on a state website if you just Google for, say, California Advanced Directive. And it's really important to think about whether you would want life prolonging interventions like a feeding tube or a ventilator, uh, et cetera. So if you can't speak, your wishes are known through the document. The second really important part, as you mentioned, is to appoint someone who knows your wishes and who will advocate for you if you can't express your wishes. So the selection of an advocate, typically uh, it is a family member, but it might not be your favorite family member. It, it needs to be the person who you think would be a strong advocate for you if you couldn't speak for yourself. And then the really critical thing is not just to appoint the person, but to have um, discussion enough that that person really knows what you might want should you not be able to speak your wishes. Um, so those are really important. Now the problem is you can go through the steps to do that and sometimes those directives still are not honored and that's its own problem. It's still really important to do it though. Um, we are uh, getting some emails and I want to, we don't have too much time, but I want to read this one. Um, Steve, I am going through this right now. I am in Glendale diagnosed with stage 4 prostate cancer, 10 on the Gleason scale. It has spread to my pelvis, ribs, femur, spine, and skull as well as to some lymph nodes. I have 24-hour nursing hospice care at home amongst other narcotics. I am using a fentanyl patch for pain control. My quality of life is nil. This is no way to live life. I was going to buy a gun a month ago, but the cancer grew too fast. Please reintroduce your guests for those joining now. We do have with us today um, for people looking for um, um, some advice um, to educate themselves on end-of-life options, Catherine Tucker, Legal Director of Compassion and Choices, and Dr. Epstein, Clinical Director of the End-of-Life Consultation Program at Compassion and Choices. And we've talked about that being a good resource for information. Um, and the website that Catherine just mentioned is www compassionandchoices.org. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Um, I'm going to ask each of you if you'd like to make any uh, final comments before we close this out. And um, it's always frustrating for me on this topic. I could talk for two or three hours. I've heard from so many people. 
and have discovered um, during and after my father's death that uh, people would like more options. They're frustrated. I frequently get um, emails from people saying that they're thinking of moving to Oregon, and then they find out that you can't just go up there on Tuesday to die on Friday. Um, I do think it is barbaric in this country, the way um, people die long, prolonged deaths, and we have to ask some questions um, in this country, um, especially given budget considerations and the fact that um, a huge percentage of Medicare costs are spent in the last year of a person's life. Medical technology has advanced to where um, we can people keep people alive almost forever. The question is, at what quality of life, and are we um, extending life or prolonging death? Um, so those are some of the issues that I will continue to write about with the help of people like uh, Catherine and, um, and Dr. Epstein. And um, readers have fueled this conversation. I have to thank readers who have kept this going, and I'll continue to work on this. Um, Dr. Epstein, um, I'll, I'll get to you first. Is there anything uh, else you'd like to add uh, by way of um, um, education or advice for people dealing with um, a terminal illness or caring for a loved one who's critically ill? Yes, I would just, I would really like to say that um, no one needs to suffer needlessly. I mean, that is our goal, and people don't know. And so, you know, we have an 800 number, 800 247 7421, and that number connects you to our main office, um, and uh, we, they can speak, anyone can speak to one of our counselors and get advice, referral, support, whatever it is they might need. We, we talk to people all over the country every day, um, so I would encourage that. Um, you know, and on the subject of suffering, when, I, when I, I've written about um, some of these folks who are, are dealing with this, and people say, well, if they're in pain, um, there are these narcotics available that are perfectly legal, and um, what I've tried to explain is that suffering takes on many forms. It's not just being in pain. Mm -hmm. In the case of my father, he was not in terrific pain, but he was suffering miserably. Um, his death was uh, dragged out over weeks and months, and just dealing with limitations and knowing that he had no quality of life and feeling as though he were a burden on his loved ones, and I knew as I watched him that if I get to a point in my life where I'm in diapers, where I can't feed myself, where my loved ones, either I don't recognize them or um, they're left with, the, you know, my mother in her 80s um, working around the clock to do a physically and emotionally exhausting job of caring for my father, even though he was in hospice. Hospice is not always there. So there's a kind of suffering that is well beyond pain. Catherine, uh, if we can get some closing comments from you and, and perhaps... Um, an, an explanation briefly of what exactly is happening in, in Hawaii and how that might have some um, ramifications in California and other states. Right. Well, yeah, thanks so much for that. And I do think the more these stories are brought forward and the more uh, that the person who sent you that email can come forward with that firsthand experience, it really rivets people's attention on the importance of the issue and that we need to empower patients with choices. And um, it may be that that individual who sent the email um, can be in touch with Compassion and Choices. We'd certainly welcome that and get information about choices that might make his death more consistent with his wishes and his values and beliefs. So that is what we always strive to do, and I'm sure we'd be happy to do it for that person. Um, you know, I think we are at a turning point in our culture at this time. Um, we have had now more than 14 years experience with an open practice of aid and dying in Oregon. It's been very closely scrutinized. It's been studied, examined, written, and talked about. And I think that the nation as a whole has at least the segment of the population that is willing to be persuaded by evidence has seen that the evidence in Oregon when aid in dying is openly available is it improves care for all patients who are terminally ill because physicians work harder to educate themselves about how to treat pain and symptoms, to have more open candid conversations with their patients. So it raises the floor for good end of life care for everyone. And for the fraction of patients who choose aid in dying, uh, they have the comfort of knowing that they have a peaceful death available if their suffering becomes unbearable. The rest of the country has watched that unfold over the last 14 years. It is why Washington was then able to enact a similar law, 
and the nation has seen that the same result happened in Washington. So I think we're at a turning point. Um, certainly that was influential to the court in Montana that respected the right to choose aid in dying as a matter of law in a lawsuit. And I think it's very much informing physician practice in Hawaii now where physicians are beginning to feel safe providing aid in dying subject to best practices. So I think there's a lot of momentum now in the direction of increasing choice to include the option for aid in dying. And I hope it won't be long before California patients um, feel comfortable having the conversation within an existing treating relationship with their physician about the choice for aid in dying. It's really time for physicians and their organizations to step up and advocate for their patients to have this choice. That's critically important. We've seen that start to happen with the American Medical Women's Association, for example, adopting policy supportive of aid in dying. Um, but it's critically important that other medical associations and physician groups step up and take on this as um, advocates for their patients because it is a good choice for some patients. Okay, once again, I want to thank our guests, Catherine Tucker and Dr. Judy Epstein from Compassion and Choices. Uh, we want to thank our viewers. I'm sorry we could not get to all of your emails. Uh, maybe we can do this at a later date. Um, I just don't think that these issues can be addressed enough. I intend to, to write more on this subject. You can see those uh, columns either in the paper or at www.latimes.com. You can find other stories um, and developments, legal and uh, news developments, at that uh, Compassion and Choices website. Um, so again, we thank you, and um, we hope that you'll tune in uh, next time we address this subject. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.